What's up guys? Welcome back to another video where we are going to be going through a bunch of code snippets and we're going to be analyzing first what the code does and second what the big O time complexity is. This is not an introduction to big O notation. We're not going to be going into any of the theory or the math. These are going to be practical coding examples and we're going to look at a bunch of them to really get that repetition. Uh, so you know, the more you do, the, the easier it becomes and the quicker you can identify what the efficiency of your code is. And you really need to know how efficient or inefficient your code is, right? It's, it's not about just writing the code anymore. Uh, you need to be able to, especially if you're expecting a lot of traffic or scaling is, is a big thing, uh, you need to be able to know where the bottlenecks of your code are. And I've even had interviews where I nailed it in the coding aspect, but when I was asked to identify the big O time complexity, I got it wrong and it led to a rejection for the interview. Before we jump into it, make sure you guys hit that like button. Also, if you haven't already, uh, feel free to join my Discord channel. I have a link to that in the description. We have about a thousand people in the tech industry, a lot of smart people, so come hang out. All right, so here's a look at the first code snippet. We're gonna be going through about five or six of these. So let's just take a look here. Also, someone in my last video said that I went a little bit too fast, so I'm going to try and slow it down a little bit and, um, you know, make sure everything is clear before we move on. All right, so here we have a function that doesn't return anything. Uh, it's called foo, and it takes in an array as its argument. So the next two lines are just declaring variables. Uh, we have this variable sum and this variable product. Then we go into this for loop where we are simply going to iterate through the length of the array. And in each iteration, we are going to just add the index of that array to the sum. Then we break out of the for loop and then we go into another for loop where we're again looping through the array and we are simply multiplying to the product whatever the index of the array is. We break out of the for loop and then we print out the sum and product. So the thing with time complexity here is we are really just worried about the parts of our algorithm where the size of our input affects the length that the uh, algorithm runs. So for example here, no matter what our array is, this declaration here of sum or you know adding to sum here, that's always gonna stay the same. Where things change is, is when we go through these for loops. So the things that don't change, we say are constant. So this is constant, this is constant. When we go through this for loop, it's going through the length of the array. We'll say that the length of the array is n. And then we also, we also have to check in here if this does anything. So indexing in an array is going to be constant time and then adding to the sum is also constant. So then we break out of this for loop and then we have another for loop. So again, this is going through the length of the array. So this will also be n. And then in here, it's a constant time operation. And then just printing this out is a constant time operation as well. So down here, we would just say we have this n here. And then since these are completely separate, these for loops, uh, there's, they're not nested within each other, we would just say we have n plus n. So this equals 2n. And in big O notation, we always drop constants because when you scale this number up to a really big number, the two doesn't really make a difference on the time complexity. So we always drop constants. So then we would just have n and this entire algorithm runs in big O of n. All right, so let's just keep trucking along here. The second problem we have here, another function that doesn't return anything. It's called print pairs and it again takes an array. So first we have this for loop here that iterates through the length of the array. And at each iteration, we do another for loop, again, going through that same array. And then finally, we just print out the indices that we're at. So inside of this for loop, again, this print statement is constant. So we're, we're not worried about that. We're only worried about these two for loops. And since these are nested, let's, let's go ahead and draw out an example. So, so say we have an array one, two, three. So our I pointer is initially pointing at I, and then our J loops through. So we go start at one, we go to two, we go to three. So this one iteration of J is gonna be N. Then what we would do is we would move our I down to two. And again, we would have to do another iteration through the entire array, which would also be N. Finally, our I would move to three. And again, we would loop through J through the entire array. So that would also be plus N. And notice that this is also N. So we're basically adding up n, n times, which is the same thing as n times n. So that becomes n squared, and this entire algorithm is big O of n squared. 
All right, so the third problem here is very similar to the last one, but we have three for loops now. Now, someone, if they're just glancing at this, they'll be like, oh, we have uh, three for loops. The other problem was n squared, so this is probably going to be n cubed. And if you said that, you would be wrong. And let's start out by looking at this inner for loop. So in here, we have k equals 0, and we're going to iterate by 1 all the way until k reaches less than 100,000. And what it does in here is it simply just prints something out. So we know that this is constant. But remember when I said that the time complexity is based on whether or not the algorithm changes based on the input? Well, no matter what, how big our arrays are here, this is always going to be counting up to 100,000, right? The, the input does not affect this. So this for loop here is actually a constant time operation, and we don't consider it in our big O notation. So we're really just worried about these two outer for loops. So in this top for loop, we iterate through array A. And for each index at array A, we loop through the entirety of array B, which is very similar to what we did last time, right? So you might be saying to yourself, uh, oh, OK, I remember that we have two for loops. They're nested within each other. So our answer is going to be n squared, which is actually going to be wrong, because uh, these are two different arrays. The, the n is the size of the array. So what, have, what we would actually have to do is we'd have to say, okay, array A, we'll say, is size A multiplied by B. So our big O here is going to be big O of A times B. Because the, the arrays, I mean, they could be the same size, but we're not guaranteed, so we need to make that distinction here. All right, next problem here we have is factorial. Now, if you don't remember, I mean, it's been a while since I've taken a math class, but say we have factorial of 3, this is going to be the same thing as 3 times 2 times one, which comes out to six. So what this is doing is it's taking in a number and that we're trying to find the factorial of. Uh, it returns an integer. And what it does is it first checks if n is less than zero, just return a minus one. If n is zero, return a one. Otherwise, we're going to return n times that we're going to recurse on factorial, except we're going to uh, put in or we're going to pass in n minus 1. Now, the time complexity of recursive algorithms can be tricky for some people. For me, it really helps to draw out the recursion tree because I'm just more of a visual person. So let's go ahead and do an example for factorial 3. So I'm just going to shorten this to f of 3. And then once we go in our code, n uh, is not less than 0, n is not equal to 0. So we go into this else statement. So we return n times factorial of n minus 1. So we're going to be n, which is 3, times factorial of 2. Now we recurse on this one. We again go into this else statement. So we have our n here, which is 2, times f of 1. And for f of 1, again, we would go into that else statement. We would get 1 times f of 0. Now at this point, we would go into this else if, and this would just return a 1. And then this would basically recurse all the way back up to f of 3. So we see when our n equals 3, this function gets called 1, 2, 3, 4 times. So it gets called n plus 1 times. And, and regardless of what our n is, this is always going to be called n plus 1 times, right? And remember that we drop the constants in big O notation. So our answer here, or our time complexity, is going to be big O of n. Alrighty, let's do a couple more here. Uh, in this one, we have the classic Fibonacci series. If you don't know what that is, it's a series of numbers where the two numbers equal the next number. So you'd have 0, 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, then you have 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, and so on. So what this does is it does the Fibonacci series recursively. So it says, Give me the nth number in the Fibonacci series, and this returns that number. So first it says, okay, if n is less than or equal to 0, just return 0. Otherwise, if n equals 1, return 1. Otherwise, return fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. Again, this is a recursive solution, so I feel like the easiest way to visualize this is by drawing a recursion tree. So let's do an example for, let's say, um, f. We'll shorten it to f of four. So I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here. So initially, uh, we don't have any of those base cases. So we go into our return statement, which is going to be fib of three plus fib of two. 
Now here we have fib of three. Again, this would go to this uh, return statement. So we'd have fib of two and fib of one. For fib of two, we again have to go to fib of one and fib of zero. So notice that when we have a uh, one here, if we go back up, we see that when we have a zero, we return zero. When we have a one, we return one. So down here, when we have a one, we return a one. When we have a zero, we return a zero, and this would recurse back up. We don't really care about this part. We just care, we just care about the, uh, the time complexity. So again, on this uh, F2, we do have to recurse for F of one and F of zero. And these would also hit the base cases and return. So how do we figure out the time complexity of this? Well, let me switch colors here. And I think this will make a lot of sense if we do it like this. So notice how this algorithm kind of has levels to it. So we have this level here. We have this level here. And then we have this level here. And notice how on each layer or each level, the number of calls is actually doubling, right? So we have one here, then it doubles to two. Then this one doubles to four. If these ones didn't hit their base case, this layer here would also have eight things on it or eight, uh, eight function calls. So what we could do is we could say, okay, we know we have two to the zero here, two to the one here, two to the two here, and two to the three, right? Because we would have eight, four, two, and one. So basically what we have here, and let me scroll down a little bit more. So what we would have here is we'd have two to the zero plus two to the one plus, and it would go all the way up to two to the n minus one, right? Because our n was four in this case. So we have three here at this last level. Now, I don't want to go too into the math theory of this, but when you have two to the zero and you add up everything all the way up to two to the n minus one, this is the same thing as two to the n, and technically it would be minus one, but remember we're dropping the constants here. So the whole thing here is going to be two to the n, and that's going to be our time complexity for the Fibonacci series using this algorithm. All right, so the last problem we're gonna look at is again, another Fibonacci problem, but a little bit modified. So this part right here is gonna actually be the exact same thing as the uh, problem we just looked at. But what this does now is it calls this function here called all fib, and this takes in our value n. And what it does is it loops through n times and calls fib of whatever uh, iteration we're on. So you might be thinking to yourself at this point, you know what? I already know from our last problem that this is two to the n. And this problem here loops through n times and calls that. So this is just gonna be n times two to the n. And if you said that, you would be wrong. And the reason you would be wrong is because the fib here, the value in here is, is, is changing on every iteration, which does actually change the time complexity. And, and let's break it down and see why. So we know that this method here is two to the n. So we know that the, the first time we call this i equals zero, so we're calling fib of zero. So zero is our n, so it's gonna be two to the zero. Then on the next loop, we're gonna be at two to the one, right? So we'll do plus two to the one. And then on the next iteration, again, it's gonna be two to the two, right? So it keeps going until it gets to n minus one. So two to n minus one. And hey, look at this. Isn't this the exact same thing that we had on our last function? And yeah, it is. So again, when you have two to the zero and you're adding every power of two all the way up to n minus one, this is the same thing as two to the n minus one. We drop the constant, we get big O of two to the n. All right, guys, that was, uh, I think we did like six or seven problems there. So. I mean, hopefully you guys got a lot of value. As you can see, especially with that last problem, this, this stuff can be tricky. So don't just, you know, look at a problem and assume you really have to sometimes break it down, sometimes draw out what your algorithm is doing just to, you know, really visualize and, and be sure of what the, the time complexity is. And, and it does require a little bit of math. I don't think anything we did here was really that crazy. 
So yeah, let me know if you guys got value out of that video. I tried to slow it down a little bit this time. You know, let me know if you want me to do another one of these problems. There are more problems. Um, also, I do want to credit that I got these problems from cracking the coding interview. I didn't want to forget to mention that. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching and supporting the channel. And um, what is it? Oh yeah, keep on coding.